At Mossy Earth, we have a growing variety of really exciting rewilding projects. And as we've been expanding our reach in the UK, there's been a bit of a common theme unfolding. More often than not, we've been replicating what beavers do. Whether if it's our direct attempts at imitation by building dams on Glassy, incorporating fallen trees and branches into the River Chew, or directly getting into character. We're always learning from nature and taking actions that allow natural processes to take the lead on our projects. But as humans, we can only be so effective. Sometimes you have to just sit back and admire the pros. And when it comes to wetland ecosystem engineering, there is no other species quite like the beaver. And here in Scotland, we're now seeing the return of this very important animal. And it's been causing a little bit of a stir, which is why we'll be meeting Tom, a farmer who's welcomed beavers back to his land, and he's now reaping the rewards of living alongside them. However, although we're now seeing beavers return to Scotland, they've had a horrible history and were hunted to extinction. The Eurasian beaver was once widespread across Europe, but by the 16th century, it was extinct in the UK, completely extinct. And there were just a few populations remaining throughout Europe, in Germany, France, and Norway. The beaver was hunted for its meat and scent glands, but largely because of its fur. Beaver pelts were highly sought after to make cold weather coats and hats. They were fashionable, and this really put a huge pressure on the beaver in the UK, so much so, it was completely eradicated. A native, charismatic creature was lost, and the shape of Britain's wetlands completely changed. But thankfully, over the past few centuries, the beaver has been recovering across Europe. We stopped hunting them, and there were laws introduced to protect them. And by the 1990s, more than 200 different translocations had taken place in 25 different European countries, but nothing had happened in the UK. But it was the Scottish National Heritage who decided to change this, and they began to make the case for the return of the beaver to Scotland. And this brought all of the necessary work which goes along with that. Stakeholder engagement, habitat assessments, impact assessments. They eventually put in the application for the beaver to return to Napdell. And this first application was rejected due to fears that the beavers would damage internationally protected woodlands. After a few years and a lot of good work, the Scottish Wildlife Trust and the Royal Zoological Society for Scotland submitted a new application for release. And in 2008, this was approved. And a year later, the beavers were released as part of a trial reintroduction. Seeing a total of 16 beavers released during the trial and it was regarded a great success. But it was also at this time that something else was unfolding. And this is kind of how it always seems to be with beavers here in the UK. During this time, an accidental beaver population was beginning to form on the River Tay. Now, we don't know whether if these beavers had been illegally released or if they'd accidentally escaped. But either way, it was this reintroduction to Napdale and, these, and this accidental beaver population on, on the Tay, which are really responsible for most of the beavers that we have throughout Scotland today. Beavers are herbivores, eating leaves, roots, woody stems and aquatic plants. They fell trees to feast upon, stripping the bark and nibbling off branches, which are then used to construct their dams and lodges, which they maintain and live in as a family. Building dams, digging trenches, moves and backs up the water, expanding their habitat. You see, beavers feel safest in the water, as there's less chance of being caught by predators. As beavers alter their environment to increase the size of their habitat, the knock-on effects for biodiversity are tremendous, improving the habitat for a wide variety of species. From insects to fish, amphibians, birds, and other small and large mammals. Even trees and vegetation benefit from having beavers around, even if they end up looking like this. Beaver ponds are deeper and larger areas of water that can withstand long, hot, dry summers, keeping the trees and plants green during these periods of drought. As trees are felled, they regrow and create a diversity in the habitat's age and structure, which is key for mammals and birds. As wood is introduced into the watercourse, this creates brilliant conditions for invertebrates to thrive, and subsequently the fish too who eat them. The knock-on benefits for biodiversity are intricate and complex, and this is why we've been doing our very best to build beaver dams over at Glassy. But first, you might be wondering, why are we mimicking beavers instead of just translocating or reintroducing them? Beaver reintroductions are heavily licensed, which we'll get more into later, but this is a barrier for many people wanting to have beavers on their land. Additionally, 
so many of our waterways have degraded riparian strips and even those areas that have seen riparian restoration, it will take a good few years before they are sufficiently mature to feed and provide materials for a family of beavers. We're addressing this through riparian tree planting throughout the UK, but in the meantime, we'll be able to help our waterways using other methods. So on Glassy, we have a very degraded burn that sits within a former non-native conifer plantation. Our surveys have shown us that although it's depleted, the area is supporting some life, but we know it should be a whole lot more. So in building a sequence of fake beaver dams, we're hoping to kickstart the dynamic processes and variation in flow that is characteristic of more natural watercourses. And along with this, we've been planting native trees along the banks of the burn. And on the River Chu in the southeast of the UK, we've been building and introducing different kinds of woody structures from whole trees to smaller branches. We're attempting to mimic the actions of the ecosystem engineering beaver. We're able to set up and fund this work through our Mossy Earth members, a global community of like-minded people who wanna see habitats recover and nature return. Monthly contributions empower us to do all of the necessary work across a wide variety of projects. From the Amazon jungle to the Benin deserts, we're always looking for effective ways to restore nature. All our work is visible through reports in your account, through these update videos here on YouTube, and also within our lovely monthly field report. And if you wanna dig a little deeper, we post a quarterly financial report, as well as our major project transactions on our website. If you're interested in becoming a member, I'll leave a link to our website down in the comments. So when it comes to the benefits which beavers can bring people, I feel like there's an idea which underpins all of it, for me anyway. It's kind of an intangible thing. It's a feeling that I get that when I come to these beaver wetlands, I just feel more at peace and I feel better connected to nature. You know, these are little pockets of wilderness which wouldn't exist without the beavers. If you look at the landscape in Scotland, you've got vast open areas. You've got loads of forestry. It's all man-made. But when you come here, this is made by beavers and you just feel better connected to nature. And that I think is really important. To better understand this relationship between beavers and people, I caught up with Tom, a Scottish farmer who runs Argety Red Kites. Here, he not only runs a functioning farm, but he's also introduced red kites and now beavers. Over the past few years, two reintroductions have taken place here on Tom's Pond, which sits within a pastoral landscape. That was the first thing that really stood out to me about the beaver habitat here, of how much it contrasted to the grassland hills surrounding it. In the patchwork of the landscape, it serves as a nice break, not only for biodiversity, but also for Tom's farm. There's always water in the pond now, but downstream it goes dry in the summer months. Yeah. Um, and then you get the series of pools down there in the winter. So it's really, really changed, you know, kind of, um, it's like a sponge that kind of soaks up water in the summertime and then lets it out in the winter. It's quite different. And how important has that been for you as a farmer? Have you been using it as a resource or have you just... The main thing actually is that they've um, really reduced flooding incidents on the farm. You know, um, again, you'd hardly believe it with this this pond when you see it now, um, but this tiny outflow stream that used to come out, which is probably that wide, um, that would have in previous years burst its banks probably four or five times in a wet winter, washed away the farm track and flooded the farmyard, mm. um, and that doesn't happen anymore. Tom was able to be strategic and to some level control where the beavers had their impact, and in turn, it's worked very well protecting his farm from flooding. But this can go the other way, where beavers create dams and flood the wrong areas. This has happened in Scotland, to farmland, and it's made many farmers fearful. But given that beavers can actually be an asset to farmers, I was interested to know exactly what has caused this fear as beavers return. There's not been a lot of positive beaver stories in the farming press, frankly. So, you know, if you're only seeing the negatives then there's gonna be that fear. I think there's also a significant amount of mistrust between farmers and conservationists as well. Um, a feeling that, you know, maybe um, one side is always doing to the other, you know. Um, and I think that runs both ways. I think the conservationists feel it as well. I mean, there are genuine concerns in some areas with beavers and um, I suppose possibly one of the real issues that we haven't as a country managed to address yet is that kind of who pays if something goes wrong situation, you know, at the moment. 
if a farmer's fields underwater, there's no compensation for that, um, no incentive schemes to encourage people to store water on land. So you know, you've got that whole issue of um, a kind of why should I suffer local pain for national gain kind of thing, you know, which is a hard one to answer. And until we answer that, then I think all reintroductions are going to be problematic. Running wildlife and beaver tours has become an important part of the business on the farm. Allowing people to come and see these relatively novel animals and their habitat is not only smart on a business sense, but it also allows those interested to see firsthand exactly what beavers can do. If you wanted to learn more or potentially book a beaver tour, we'll leave a link to their website in the description. I would also like to thank Elliot from the Beaver Trust, who provided us with some beautiful footage of beavers to use in this video. Do be sure to check out the Beaver Trust as they do all kinds of crucial work to restore, educate and protect beavers in Britain. I'm just going to be a little bit quiet because they're over there in their lodge asleep. Man, it must be, I reckon it's quite cosy in there, you know, family of beavers all, all nestled up. I hope you've enjoyed this look into beavers here in Scotland. And if you're interested in supporting our rewilding efforts, not just here in Scotland, but now all over the world, then you can become a member. What I'll do is I'll leave a link down in the comments which will take you to our website. But please, I encourage you to watch some more of our videos here to really get a good understanding of what we do here at Mossy Earth. In the meantime, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.